Well, good morning and welcome to From Hiring to Firing, What Every Employer Needs to Know, an NJBIA HR program brought to you by Association Member Trust, Citizens, Connell Foley, Focus New Jersey, New Jersey Business Magazine, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, and NJBIA HR Sports Center. I'm Alice Skens, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer and CFO with NJBIA. And today, today with us is Marianne Tolomeo of Connell Foley. Before we get started, I'd like to show you a quick video on some of the things NJBIA has been working on recently. For those of you who are new to NJBIA, we are the largest statewide business association in the country, representing approximately 1 million jobs in the state of New Jersey, which amounts to about one quarter of New Jersey's workforce, offering customer development opportunities, visibility through events, magazine ads, podcast and TV show, and money-saving discounts on things you're probably already paying for, like payroll, healthcare, a 401k solution, and our new HR support center, powered by Mineral HR. Your business is your passion, but running it gets harder every day because laws change and compliance tasks change. So many questions, so many answers, so many tools, so many documents all over the place. Am I doing it right? Am I missing something? Change, worry, risk. It's constant. It's overwhelming. That's why you need the Mineral Platform, your single destination for all your HR and compliance needs. We take away the guesswork with a clear, concise assessment of your HR and compliance needs thousands of workplace compliance resources that are easy to find, a smart employee handbook builder that updates policy changes as they happen, thoughtfully curated courses to address harassment and safety, and much more, all in one place. We're a team of trusted experts in your corner, ready to provide faster, accurate guidance with challenging HR or compliance questions, and most importantly, peace of mind. And powering the platform is Mineral Intelligence, delivering personalized recommendations based on your company profile and our expertise on your HR and compliance needs. When there's something you need to know or do, we'll bring it right to your attention before you ask. By combining the best of data, technology, and human expertise, the Mineral Platform is your essential foundation to a healthier organization and a more empowered you. Navigating HR and compliance is complex, and we will make it easier for you. Mineral. HR and compliance made simple. Okay, thanks, Danielle. If you're interested in more information on that platform, 401k, healthcare, or the HR on demand, I'll drop our website information in the chat along with my contact information. Feel free to be in touch and we can get you whatever you need. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be emailed to you within a week along with the PowerPoint. So please be on lookout for those. I'd like to draw your attention to the chat. Marianne will be happy to take your questions. So get them in as they come to you via the chat section. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Marianne Tolomeo, a partner in Connell Foley's Labor and Employment Group, practices primarily in the areas of employment law and commercial litigation. Marianne regularly presents seminars to business groups and HR professionals on a variety of employment topics, including compliance with wage and hour regulations, managing leaves of absence, the preparation and use of job descriptions, proper hiring techniques, social media policies, updates to EEO-1 requirements, employee handbooks, and civil trial preparation. So now, please join me in welcoming Mary Ann Tolomeo. Good morning, everyone. I just am going to go share my screen with you. There we are. Okay. In giving this presentation, I wanted to let everybody know that I look at this really from a perspective of a litigation attorney. In other words, I am involved in defending lawsuits against employers um, who have been sued for discrimination, retaliation, and other um, employment claims. As a result, when I go through my presentation, I will tell you why certain things are important, that they have real life implications. Um, so I'm going to, let's see, I'm really bad at this. I was going to get started and I'm having a hard time. 
You should be able just to use the arrow key to move it up and down or your mouse, Marianne. Okay, that's what I'm trying to do. There we are. Okay, so in terms of the agenda, um, we're going to look at both hiring and firing. I'm also going to have some things to say on orientation once you have in fact hired someone. So we'll look at advertising, recruitment, um, what to ask for in the application, um, what happens when you use social media, what to ask in an interview, and more importantly, what not to ask in an interview, um, how to use background checks, and how to um, convey offers of employment. On the firing side, um, we're going to talk about best practices for terminating employees, um, how important it is to be consistent, some errors that are made, what you should consider when you're making a decision to terminate um, an employee, and some tips on what to do as you actually go through the process of terminating them. Um, and finally, whether it's a good idea for you to have an employee sign a separation agreement. Now, okay. in terms of advertisements, um, you'll see here I say, advertise the position through several sources that will reach a cross section of the population. Why is that important? That's important because you wanna get a broad range of applicants. You don't wanna just gear your ad your advertisement to one section of the population that may result in um, an overrepresentation of certain groups in the people that respond and ultimately then the people that you will consider for hiring and ultimately do hire. Um, so you want to get it to a lot of people so that you are not, there's no chance that you are discriminating by, for example, you know, sending the ad to only women's groups so that only women are gonna apply for the position. Um, so that's number one. Number two we're talking about is disabilities. Um, it's important that you, your application and your advertisements don't screen out people that may have disabilities. And we'll talk about what should actually be in the application um, and when you can ask about disabilities in the hiring process. Um, now, essential job functions. I can't emphasize how important it is that when you advertise for a job, and when you create a job description, that it be accurate, that it, you really look at what is necessary for this job. And it's not just the performance of, um, you know, the, for example, the mental task. It's also the physical task that you might not think about. So you start at the very beginning with the advertisement to identify and project what those essential requirements are. You do not want to include things that are not essential, things that, um, you know, are 1% of the job or that could easily be shifted to someone else. Again, that's because when you look down the line, you may have an issue with somebody who needs accommodation. And what are you going to look at? You're going to look at what the employer has said are the essential job functions. Okay, now. So you've gotten to the point, you've decided that you're going to hire someone, and you're putting together the advertisement or the recruiting profile if you're going to use someone to help recruit. Um, so as I said, you start with the essential functions of the job. So you also, it's not just mental, it's physical. Is somebody going to have to carry documents? Is someone going to have to, um, you know, climb stairs? Are they going to have to reach? Are they going to have to go down low? All kinds of physical um, parts of the job that would be necessary for an employee to perform should they get the position. Um, in addition to identifying those job requirements or essential job functions that are physical, you have to say how much of the time a person is going to spend doing those things. Um, then you have to talk about the skills, the knowledge, the abilities. Um, you want to say what the level and scope of authority is, and you want to say who they will report to. There are, in fact, some um, websites that will help you uh, create job descriptions. One is the Job Accommodation Network, which you can click in, you can put in a certain job title, and it will list the type of functions that you might consider putting into your um, description. Some of the things that you always should consider putting on the uh, advertisement are the education. How much education is required? Um, any exception where work experience will be considered in lieu of a formal education. Um, so in, in doing this, you have to think about what's really needed. Sometimes, you know, a, a advertisement will require, say, a college education, but it's really not needed. And we're now seeing, for example, the New Jersey state government um, taking away or eliminating 
the requirement of a college education because it has a discriminatory effect. And it's not those sorts of requirements were put in job descriptions. And at the end of the day, the college um, degree was not really necessary. So the state government has gone through and is now eliminating those kinds of requirements if they are not necessary. Um, work experience. You know, if you really want an employee to have a certain amount of experience, or you don't want someone coming in with absolutely no training, you can put that down. You know, location. Now, after the pandemic, um, this is one of the more important categories or information that employees, potential employees want to see. Do they have to go to the office? Is the job remote? If they have to go to the office, is it five days a week or is it three days a week? It's something that is becoming more and more important to employees now that they've seen that um, a lot of jobs can be done remotely. Um, and it's one of the um, factors that employers are dealing with on a daily basis. So that's very important. Um, classification, is the job exempt or non-exempt? Again, that's important down the line because an employee may claim that they're not getting overtime. But if from the very beginning, the employer identified it as an exempt position, and in fact, it is exempt. It fits the criteria for being exempt. Um, in most cases, that's because it's a white collar exemption. It's either professional, administrative, or executive. Um, you, you, that will be the determinative factor in terms of whether it's exempt, not whether the employer simply classified it as exempt. And on this note, I just want to, an aside, because this is something we find over and over again, is that employers believe that if they pay an employee a salary, that person is exempt from overtime. That is not the case. The salary requirement is, in fact, one of the criteria for being exempt, but it's not the only criteria. There are other criteria that have to do with the nature of the job, the nature of the um, training for professionals, um, the number of people that are supervised for the executive, whether um, the employees in charge of a whole department or one of the operations. Um, so it's not just the salary. Um, so that's, I always say that when I get a chance to say it, because more often than not, when I ask a client whether the position is exempt, they say, yes, I paid them a salary. Um, and that's not the determinative factor. Um, class certifications and licenses, obviously, if the employee needs a particular degree, a particular certification in order to perform the job, you're going to want to put that in the job advertisement. Um, again, if it's not really necessary, you wouldn't want it in the advertisement because you may be screening out people that could do the job um, and it might have a discriminatory effect. Okay, hours of work. Um, this is very important from an expectation point of view. Um, that you are conveying to the employer, employee from the beginning. What are you really expecting in terms of hours? Are some nights and weekends required? Um, if so, say it. Um, if they have to be on call, are they going to be engaged to wait or waiting to be engaged? That's a, those are phrases um, that are used to determine whether someone must be paid or need not be paid. So if someone is at home and they're on call and they can do anything they want, they can go out to dinner, they can go shopping, they can watch a movie on TV, then they are waiting to be engaged. They're not actually working. Um, so you need not pay them until a call comes in and the person is actually tapped to start working. If on the other hand, they are engaged to wait, they can't do anything else. They have to stay glued to the phone, be ready to, to do what they're going to be doing. Um, it is something that the employer probably needs to pay them at. For example, common example is um, a firefighter who's at the um, firehouse. They, they can't really leave and go to the mall or go to the food store. So they, they do get paid. Um, and we talked about work on the nights and weekends, holidays. That, that is very important in terms of expectations. Um, language skills, an obvious category if someone needs to speak a different language in order to communicate with customers um, or other employees, it's important to identify that. Travel requirements, very important. Um, you know, if somebody is going to be using their car on a daily basis to travel, you want to let them know that in the advertisement. 
um, if they if it's cross country, if it's international, these are all expectations that someone scanning advertisements or a recruiter is going to want to know um, when looking for candidates for your job, your organization. Now, catch all statements again, very very important. You always want to say that the position includes other responsibilities, that there may be other duties associated with it. The employer has the right to amend and modify the job description. Why is that important? You want to retain flexibility. You know, um, jobs change every day. You may go, your organization or company may go in a different direction. Um, a new, you know, something new may develop that new skills are required. You may shift somebody's responsibilities and you don't want to be locked into this is your job and this is what your job is going to be for the next 10 years. As the employer, you want to retain that flexibility to shift, expand, retract, whatever you need to do in the best interest of your company. So from the very beginning, you want that to be on the job description, on the advertisement. We see um, the the phrase that the employer is an equal opportunity employer on on many, almost all applications and um, advertisements. Again, it's something that just sets the standard. It says we're complying with the government requirements to be an equal opportunity employer. Um, now, what what kind of questions that can the employer ask on the application? Um, there's, we have a whole list of do's and don'ts, and we're going to get into them later. And generally, we're talking about do's and don'ts that apply both to the application and to the interview. There are questions that you may ask, and there's questions that you may not ask. So, for example, um, you do not want to ask about marital status. Um, I find that that's probably more of an issue in the interview. The application is a written form, and you can look at that before it's um, disseminated, before people have to fill it out. You can be very careful about that. You can be careful about what's in your handbook. You can be careful about um, what information you ask an employee for when they're hired and they fill out the onboarding paperwork. What's a little bit harder is that when you're interviewing, you know, we're people, we have conversations, um, but it's important to remember what things can and can't be said. Um, marital status is one, U.S. citizenship, anything that's going to elicit that someone belongs in a certain category. Um, so if it's around the holiday, well, we'll talk about that in terms of interviews. This is just the application. Um, number three is personal interest. Why wouldn't you ask that on an application? Because it can reveal protected categories and membership in a protected class. Um, age or date of birth, a clear um, prohibition. You do not want to ask age or date of birth. And frankly, you should not ask on the application um, date of graduation from an, a school or an institute, because again, that can lead to an assumption regarding the age of the person. So if, for example, you ask for the age of a college graduation and the person writes um, 1968, what does that tell you? That tells you that in 1968, the um, candidate was already in their 20s. Um, and that will, you know, be, I'm sorry, that will mean that the candidate is older than many other candidates. So you don't, you just don't need that information. So it should not be on the application. Okay. Again, um, there are questions to ask. It's not the employer's um, right to ask if somebody is a citizen. All the employer may ask is whether someone is legally authorized to work in the United States, because that's the criterion. And frankly, the discrimination laws do you know, it's not just citizens that the anti-discrimination laws protect, they protect non-citizens as well. Um, you know, there are cases in New Jersey where the plaintiffs, the defendants, the employers, um, lawyer, when the plaintiffs were being examined during the trial, you know, wanted to ask about whether they were authorized to work in the United States, were they, you know, what we call illegal um, workers. And that was considered to be reversible error because it is not it was not relevant to whether they were entitled to be paid for the work that they were doing and how much they were entitled to be paid. Um, handicap or disability, um, that's not something that should be on the application. 
Um, we'll get to later when you can, you know, ask questions about that. Um, don't ask questions that reveal political affiliation, military experience, again, marital status or race. Um, photographs, why do we say don't ask for photographs? Because a photograph can tell you um, a fair amount about a person. It can very often convey race, it can convey sex, gender. Um, and once you ask for a picture, it's there, it's in the application. So at a later date, if there is a lawsuit or a question, when you pull out the application or the applications that were submitted, and it turns out that 20 people submitted applications, you got photographs, um, and out of the 10 that you chose to interview, nine were male or nine were white. Um, you might not have known that if you didn't ask for a photograph. So the way to protect yourself is to not ask for a photograph because frankly, you should not be um, measuring or selecting candidates based on what they look like in a photograph. Um, one of the new areas that is becoming protected is obesity. Um, again, that's something that can be disclosed in a photograph. So you're not gonna ask for that when you ask somebody to submit a application. I'm sorry, make sure you are fully there. I'm sorry. Um, I have to go back. I'm not good at this. Oh, well, Danielle, could you go back two slides? I'm sorry. I thought I did it too quickly. Um, yeah, are you able to go back two I slides can. on your end? I okay. can't do it. Give me I'm one sorry. second and I will take over. Oh, do I? You know what? Well, I'm just going to, if you can't do it, I'll just go yep. ahead. We're going yet. Yeah, the number five, the application. Um, yes, we're at um, the one that starts with number five. Yes, at the bottom oh. of that. Um, yep, the bottom, me... yeah, the final. Sure. We're going to move ahead. You could, I mean, frankly, just go back one. Let me see if I can do it. Oh, shoot. Okay. I'm, I'm making. Yeah, I'll just have to share my screen. So give me one second. Sure. Well, while we're doing that, um, on the application part, um, it's important that you make sure that the uh, candidate fills out the entire application. You know, sometimes you just look at certain categories and you do not look at the entire application. You definitely want it to be completed. And as we move ahead, oh, now Danielle has it. You also want to have an acknowledgement section. And what the acknowledgement section says at the end of an application is that the employee or potential employee is um, acknowledging and promising basically that the application um, information is accurate and that the potential employee or candidate knows that if it's not accurate, um, it's a reason for not extending an offer. It's a reason for reneging or withdrawing an offer and ultimately a reason for um, you know, termination should the person later be given the job and something is discovered that shows that they were um, dishonest on the application. That is something that I go back to. I will often ask to see the application um, for employment when it's time, you know, the person has worked, they've been terminated, they may say that they're suing, they may actually file the lawsuit. Um, you, you may look at the application because it may turn out that that person was not qualified for the job and, and they did, were dishonest about it. And that can be very important. It can be what we call after acquired evidence. What does that mean? It means that the person um, had something that disqualified them from the job or means that you would have terminated them anyway. And therefore you don't um, have to pay damages from the point you discover it onwards. So for example, if somebody puts on their application that they have a certain certification or degree that is important, a license that they need to perform that job in the state of New Jersey, and it turns out they don't have it, they are disqualified from the position and they can be terminated. There was once a case in New Jersey where somebody sued the state on a um, whistleblower claim. It later um, came to light that the person had a criminal conviction in their background and frankly were wasn't 
disqualified from on a statutory ground from having the job. And what did that mean? That meant that they really, they, they couldn't have held the job and they couldn't recover any damages going forward because it would have been illegal on the part of the employer, which was actually a state um, institution to continue to employ them. So it's really important to have that acknowledgement on the application that puts it right in front of the applicant that in fact, if anything is false, it gives the employer certain rights with respect to the um, hiring and perhaps the termination going forward. Okay, um, Danielle, let's see, we're gonna go forward. Two slides, we've done that one. The next one is social media. Okay. Social media, if you asked employers how many use social media for hiring purposes, a large majority do. And when we say social media, it's anything, um, uh, you know, from checking out somebody's Facebook page to LinkedIn profile, um, to just Googling them and seeing what they can find out. But there are a lot of positive things about social media. Um, you get more information that might be on the resume or in the application. Um, and it's very easy to do. We're on our computers all day. So why not put somebody's name in, find out, you know, find out more than you might know. You might find out, you know, on um, what they're involved in on a personal level, um, when they did graduate from school, things like that. Um, and there are things that you can find out in social media and internet searches that are in fact legal to rely on in making a um, hiring decision. So, you know, you might find out that there's some illegal drug use going on, that somebody says really terrible things about their employer. Um, and when we say terrible things, I don't mean that they say challenge that the employer discriminates against um, other employees, things like that, because you wanna um, be careful about something like that, relying on a statement like that or information on the person's um, link, you know, website, their, their social media profile, et cetera, that, that says something like that. Um, but there are other things that you can know. You can know from it that somebody doesn't communicate well, and that might be very important to you. It, it's, it is important to a lot of jobs, and it's frankly something that is um, you know, becoming more important as time goes on if, if the job involves writing, it's something you want to know. And if you are just given a writing sample, you might not see that. So if you you know find out that from looking at someone what somebody posts, if they have poor writing, you may want to take that into consideration. Okay, we can advance. Okay, but even though social media can provide good information and it's easy to do, there are reasons not to do it. Um, the reason is not to do it is primarily that you can find out information that disclose whether somebody's in a protected um, class. So for example, the information I gave before or spoke about with respect to a photograph applies um, directly to internet searches and social media searches. The, the um, protected classifications that I mentioned before, race, um, you know, uh, gender, perhaps um, physical attributes, et cetera, may be very apparent um, when you look somebody up on social media. Um, their involvement in certain groups, for example, are they involved in their church, in their temple? Um, that might be apparent. And so then you know, um, or you have a basis for assuming or thinking that a person belongs to a certain religious group um, that you would not have known if you just looked at their resume and the application that they completed. Once you know something, you can't unring that bell. You may not take it into consideration at all. It may have nothing to do with your hiring requirement. You know, giving that example of, you know, there are 20 applicants and you select 10 to interview. It may be, in fact, that um, you interviewed, I don't know, um, eight people who said they belonged to a temple on their, um, on their resume. Um, that show doesn't show anything, but it, it is a statistic that could later be used. So, for example, if somebody is hired and they later charge you with discrimination on the basis of religion, um, you know, you, it, you want to know, somebody might want to know, who did you select when you looked, you know, did you look at social media? 
Um, let's look at those social media profiles. Let's see who you selected for an interview. So even though you might have no discriminatory, um, what we call animus or motivation, who you select to interview um, can be very important. And that's why we caution people about looking at social media profiles and internet sites. Um, the last point we have here is that New Jersey has a very um, strong and explicit prohibition on asking potential candidates or employees for their social media um, logon information. The employer is not required. I mean, it's not, it's just not required, it's forbidden from asking candidates for that information so that the employer, potential employer can go check out everything they can find out about the person on the internet. We can advance. Okay. If you're going to use or decide that, yes, you know what, I'm part of the 90 plus percentage of employers that are going to use internet and social media screening um, for hiring purposes, you can put into place certain um, guidelines that help protect you somewhat against the downsides of using social media um, research. One is that you, you really want to standardize it. You want the same person or, or two people, whoever it is, to, to do this search. You want them to use the same standard um, search time, terms, the same standard sites that they go to. Um, uh, you know, you want it to be based on non-discriminatory. I'm sorry, is everything good? non-discriminatory factors. So for example, as I said earlier, you can use something like writing skills to check someone's, um, you know, check on social media or, you know, websites that they might have authored or, you know, be featured on. Um, that's a non-discriminatory factor that you can look at. And you can have the people you've assigned to look at, do social media research, look at that. You can't have on the uh, checklist or the, the form that you're, they're going through, um, you know, how old is the person look? Um, or, you know, is it, they, are they, what's their gender? You know, what's their age? Things like that. You're not going to have that as a criteria. Um, and again, if you designate somebody, it should be a non-decision maker, just someone who's going to gather the facts for you. Um, and so if it's not you, it sort of insulates you from the selection process. If you've given the person very clear guidelines and they do not have discriminatory um, qualifications on them and that person um, selects based on that and then they give them to you, there's just a little bit more insulation because if, for example, the website perhaps shows that someone, I don't know, graduated from... Um, college or high school on a, certain, on a certain year, and that's not on the form that was given to you. And you didn't know that. And you didn't consider it because you never did the website search or the social media search. That provides some insulation um, from a later claim that you were trying to look for people in a certain age range. Um, try to independently verify information from other sources. And, you know, when we, we say something like that, again, it's sources that are um, legal sources. So again, if you, if you think somebody's a good writer, you may wanna write, ask for a writing sample. If you call somebody for a, um, you know, referral, you may wanna ask, what are their writing skills like? You're, you're trying to support the things that have been learned by the, the person in your organization that looked up candidates on the internet. Um, very big um, prohibition, don't friend people. Don't um, try to join their LinkedIn network. Um, you know, that, that first of all provides a digital footprint that you were looking. Um, and second of all, can be misleading. Um, and I know in the legal profession, people have been um, sanctioned ethically for doing that in connection with, you know, trials. For example, you know, they have a list of the potential jurors and they go friend the people to try to find out what they can about them. That's not considered, um, you know, an appropriate use of social media and can get the employer, the lawyer, whoever it is, into hot water for doing something like that. Um, so again, you have to be careful about trying to friend or link up with somebody on social media. Okay, we can go forward. Um, so you've gotten your group of candidates and now you're gonna move on to hire, to actually interviewing them. And on the interview um, part, well, just some tips, we're starting with some tips and then we'll talk about 
permissible and impermissible questions. Um, okay. We have to just move forward, but that's okay. Um, when you're going to do the interviews, you should come up with your list of questions. What's important? What do you really want to know about this person? Um, uh, you know, in, in doing that, you're going to have to talk to the people who are actually going to be working with the you know employee when they're hired. What's important for you to know? Um, you know, again, if you're not in HR and you're going to be doing the interview, it helps to have HR look at it. It helps to have management look at it to see if you're actually asking questions that are appropriate and important in, in terms of gauging suitability for the job. Now, again, you want to standardize things. You want the same outline. You want the same questions as much as possible to be asked of the candidates because then you have an even playing field. Um, in terms of um, the selection process itself. Uh, you need to know, again, we go back to the essential job requirements. Why is that important? It's important, A, just from expectations. You want to convey the appropriate um, functions that the person is going to be if they are hired. Um, and But second of all, if there's later a problem, you want to make sure that it's absolutely clear what those functions were or what you expected the person to be doing, what you required them to be doing from the very beginning, from the time you interviewed them, that there's no mistake that you told the person when they, at the very beginning, when they were interviewing, that you needed them to do X, Y, and Z. Um, guarantees and promises. Um, that stay away from that. And those can be very um, simple ones. Like if the application or the um, application or the um, advertisement, the recruitment profile says that, um, you know, work on nights and weekends is required from time to time. In the interview, you don't want to say, oh, we never work, you know, at nights or on weekends, because you're undercutting the objective, um, you know, evidence of what you were asking for. So, and you're also setting expectations. So if you say that to a potential employee and they think, oh, great, I'm never going to be asked to work on at a night or on a weekend. Um, and then they come in in the first week or the second week, you ask them to work three nights in a row, you're going to have a problem, even if it's just in terms of um, the, you know, the disappointment, the reaction of the employee to that. And it also, you know, it might be impossible for them to work nights. They may, you know, need to have some coverage for an elderly parent, or they may have another job they go to. So it's really important not to make any guarantees or promises, especially ones that are inconsistent with what the advertisement or the formal um, description of the job are. Um, you should ask open-ended questions. Because if you just ask, black, you know, just questions that are yes, no, you're not going to find out that much about the, the candidate. You ask open-ended questions, you find out how, um, you know, how comfortable they are with the areas. If they, if, you know, you're asking about, it, you know, their experience and they really can't answer the question, then you might think, well, maybe they don't have that experience. Or you might, you know, might interact personal interactions may be very important with the job. They're dealing with the public all the time. So if you ask open-ended questions, you get a sense of their facility um, in talking to people and responding to inquiries. Um, the final tip is always have your, your you know, smooth closing in place, what you're going to tell them about next steps, um, how long it's going to take to get to that next step. Um, again, you're managing expectations. Um, you don't want to get calls starting the next day from the 10 people that you interviewed the day before. You, you want to tell them other candidates are under consideration. We're going to be doing this interviewing process through the next week. By telling them, telling the candidate that you're setting their expectation and, um, you know, making it clear that they are not the only person being interviewed, et cetera. Okay. Now we'll talk about what's permissible and what's not permissible. So I've taken some of the major, you know, protected categories and talked about in the next slide um, what you can ask and what you can't ask. Age is is one of those categories um, that you know people can or I'm sorry, employers um, might be interested in, but it's not something that can a, can be a basis for offering a job or not offering a job. So what's legal? It's legal to ask if they're over 18, you know, if they um, are able to, you know, 
are they adult, legal, et cetera? Um, what are your long-term career goals? You can ask that because that's a legitimate inquiry. If you, the company, is looking for someone that they want to stay long-term, you know, that's going to involve a lot of training. It's going to involve getting to know customers. And it's really important that the customers develop a relationship with that job that the person is interviewing for, you can ask them what their long-term career goals are. You know, they might say to you, well, I'm planning to move to California in a year or two, you know, because I, my long-term career goal is to get into the film industry. I don't know how many candidates would say that, but that's an easy example of where you get information that might tell you that this is not the candidate for you. Um, impermissible inquiries, as we said before, you know, when were you born? When did you graduate from high school? How old are you? Which is very um, direct. Um, how much longer do you plan to work before you retire? The truth is, um, you know, these, these questions don't have anything to do really with somebody's ability to do the job. Um, and, you know, somebody could be 60 years old and plan to work another 20 years. Somebody could be, you know, 40 years old or 38 years old and plan to retire at 45. So a question like that is not only illegal, but it doesn't really, um, you know, tell you that much because people's, people's goals and decisions change all the time. And you're making a decision um, based on, you know, an artificial, this is how long I'm going to work before I retire, when it may not be true. Okay. The next category is religion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, religion is an area now that's becoming um, more focus is being put on it because of certain, um, you know, discriminatory trends that are, you know, have been apparent in the country. Um, so it's it's important for you to in your job hiring to make sure you're staying away from any sort of discriminatory inquiries with respect to religion. Um, you can ask what days people are available to work. Again, um, your your uh, company may be open certain days. It may be that the busiest days of the week are Saturdays or Sundays. And if someone is not going to be available at all on those days, you may want to know that. Um, you do want to know that. There is actually a decision um, pending in the Supreme Court of the United States right now on that issue. So we're going to have a little bit more guidance on that um, very shortly, because all the decisions have to be answer, um, released by the end of June. Um, in that case, somebody couldn't work on a particular day on the weekend, and the employer ultimately terminated them um, because of the burden it placed on other employees, I believe. And the standard right now for determining um, whether the employer is placing a burden on religious um, observance or the, the employee's religion is pretty easy to meet right now. It's pretty easy as long as the employer can show, um, I think it's an undue burden, then they they can use that and say, you know, we can't have you here because we need, you know, 90% of our workforce, 100% of our workforce available on Sundays or Saturdays. But the Supreme Court is looking at that and they may in fact increase um, the showing necessary to use um, someone's religious um, holy days or religious observance days as a basis for termination or job qualification. Um, yeah. Ask about professional trade groups, um, you know, and again, when, when someone's able to work. Um, you can ask what their religion is, what do you know, what religious holidays do you deserve, observe? So are you going to be available to work on Christmas? Are you going to be available to work on um, Easter? Do you, are there days that you need off in September or October? That's our busy time of year. Things like that you do not want to ask because those um, do disclose things about someone's religion or have the risk of doing that. Okay. Next, the next area is marital and family status inquiries. Um, you definitely do not want to ask people if they're married, if um, they have a significant other, uh, things like that, that, that tend to disclose their marital status. Um, you know, as I said before, we're people. And sometimes you very much like a candidate and you may get into a discussion with them about, you know, their marital status. They may bring it up. They may say, oh, you know, um, I'm getting married in three months, so I'm going to need two months, you know, two weeks off from the work. They brought it up. That's fine. 
um, you know, you can you can acknowledge that and move on. You don't have to ask the name, for example, of um, the person they're engaged to, because that might tell you their um, sexual preference. So you, you have to be careful even when the candidates volunteers information. Um, so we've listed some of the permissible questions. Have you worked under another name? Um, that could be important from a perspective of, um, you know, getting references, because if somebody changed their name, or if you're going to do a background check, you do need to know the other name they may have worked at. You don't, you're not entitled to know why their name has changed, frankly. Um, are you available to work overtime on occasion? Can you travel? These are legitimate job requirements, depending on the job. Um, on the other hand, if they're not connected to the job, if your business is open from eight to four every day and nobody has worked overtime in the last 20 years, that's not a question you should be asking because it can elicit information about their family um, status that you're not entitled to know. Um, and again, it just looks like you are fishing for information because you may or may not want to hire a certain group of people. You may believe that people with young children have to take more days off from work. That's not a legitimate um, criteria for hiring somebody. So that way, if you ask if they can work overtime or whether they can travel, it may be an underhanded way of trying to elicit that information. Um, again, asking about long-term career goals is fine. That, that's, um, you know, that's fine for you to do. Um, impermissible, what's your maiden name? Um, do you have or do you plan to have children? Can you get a babysitter on short notice for overtime or travel? Um, if you get pregnant, will you come back to work after maternity leave? These are very direct questions. Um, and by asking them, you are conveying that this is important to you and that it is this factor that you may be considering and deciding which candidate to offer the job to. So it is important that you don't ask questions like that. Okay. We can move to the next slide. We're going to talk about gender inquiries. Um, in this one, we really let's start with the impermissible. Okay, um, you know we've always had a man woman do this job. How do you think you'll stack up? How do you feel about supervising men or women? You don't ask questions like that. Um, it's hard for me to believe that those questions actually would be asked at this point. Um, the permissible questions um, have really nothing at all to do with um, gender. They're just, what do you have to offer the company? Tell me what your previous work experience is. Um, have you ever been disciplined for your behavior at work? These are these are questions that um, may get to factors that are important for you. So if, if someone has been disciplined at work for um, harassing an employee of the other sex or another gender, um, and they offer that to you in response to the question, um, that is important. You, you're free to reject somebody because they have, you know, been accused and um, it's been sustained that they were harassing someone, but you're not asking there about, you know, whether they get along with women or men that they supervise. You're simply asking them about their employment history. Okay. The next category is nationality inquiries. Um, and we already talked about this. It's not it's not permissible to ask whether somebody's a citizen. It's not permissible to ask about their native language, not permissible to ask how long they've lived here, which um, can be construed as the United States. It's not permissible to ask somebody where they were born. Um, again, the um, a lot of rights extend to people who are not citizen. The question is, are they qualified to work in the United States? Do they have the authorization? Do they have a visa? Do they need, you know, do they have the papers and clearances that they need to work? That's what you as an employer should be um, focused on in terms of where they come from, what their background is. Um, what languages do you read, speak, or write fluently? Um, it could be a job requirement. Now, again, if it's not a job requirement, then frankly, you shouldn't be asking it. So for example, if you ask, if you um, have a store that is in a um, neighborhood with a lot of many Latina or Latino um, 
residents who are going to come in on a daily basis and 75 percent of the people that come into the store um, uh, have a native language that is not english it, it's you know spanish that's a legitimate question do you do you speak do you understand um spanish if that is not something that the employee is ever going to have to do or it has never come up for um you know in, in prior for prior employees there's no reason to ask that question. And it can be viewed as a question that is screening out people. Because again, you interview 10 people, you ask that, and six of the people say, yes, I speak Spanish or I speak Portuguese, whatever it is, seven people say that. And you, net, you don't hire that person or extend an offer. And that's a trend that's a, you know, parent over several, um, job you know candidate selections then you're getting yourself into a situation where you've been asking people about what they languages they speak for no legitimate reason and lo and behold those people end up not being offered a position so again the choices that you make in terms of the questions may not seem significant when you're asking them but later on they can be viewed through a very different lens okay all right, the next one, I think we may be done. Oh, no, we're not. Disability increase. Now, um, really, the only thing that you are permitted to ask is, are you able to perform the essential job functions with or without an accommodation? Again, we go back to what are the essential job functions. If you have that at your fingertips, you know what you have already defined as the functions that a candidate or an employee is going to need to do. Um, or you can just refer to one of them. Lifting 50 pounds is something that's done, you know, 10 times a day. It's a specific job requirement. Are you able to do that? Um, again, because it's key to a job requirement, it's a legitimate question. Um, but it, you can't say to someone or ask them, do you have disabilities? Is there anything I should know about your physical health? Um, you know, you have any limitations based on this, that, or the other past illnesses. You're just fishing for information that, frankly, you do not want to rely on. So you should not be asking the question. Job-related injuries, um, you know, people or employers can use that to find out, you know, whether someone with a physical condition is. It can also be used to screen out whether people have um, filed workers' complaints in the past. So you, you would want to stay away from that. Okay, now we're done with the questions. I hope everybody now knows what they can and cannot ask. Um, you've done the interview process, you've narrowed it down, um, and you want to do a little in other research on your candidates. Perhaps you have selected someone and you've decided, you know what, this is the person that I want to offer the job or the company wants to offer the position to. At that point, you may want to do background checks. Um, you can do them for a lot of reasons. You don't want to avoid people that are going to um, cause liability. They could harm your business. They they might um, present a risk of theft, fraud, workplace die, um, violence. You want people that are trustworthy. So what do you do? You say, I want to do a background check. Um, uh, I put some statistics up here about misrepresentations. It's It's amazing to me that people would misrepresent at this rate when there's so much information available. Um, but it does happen. Okay, next um, slide. There's different kinds of background checks. Um, criminal history, some jobs require that, you know, by statute. If someone is going to be a school teacher, if somebody's going to work in school, you have to do a criminal background check. Credit history, medical records, drug testing, these are all the different types of background checks that can be done. And they are permissible or not permissible in different um, situations. We can move forward. Um, the reason, there's just a little slide here on discrimination. Um, you know, this is almost self-evident. You can't base it, a background check you can't base it on looking for something that's a protected characteristic. Um, you know, you, you can't do it to find out if somebody, for example, um, what their gender preferences or anything like that, or, you know, what their race, where they came from, et cetera. Those are not the things you're looking for. Um, okay, you want to apply the same standards to everyone. You want to ask the person doing the background check to use the same um, inquiries, the same standards in getting the information that they're going to convey to you. We can go um, to the next slide. Um, different ways to do it. An internet search you can do yourself. You can 
retain a third party to do it, to do the investigation. For um, background checks, criminal background checks, you can send an inquiry to law enforcement. E-Verify, I have here, that's really, um, you know, is mostly used when somebody is um, offered a job and is to check their, basically their I-9, um, the forms that have been completed, and it's a way to register that you've done it. Um, next slide, Fair Credit Reporting Act. That's when you hire somebody, a third party, to do the investigation. Um, if you do that, there is very clear um, hoops that you have to jump through, okay? You have to tell the potential employee that you're doing it. You have to get an authorization to conduct the check. Then the next thing is, what do you do? Next slide, if something negative comes back, okay? If it does, you have more notification requirements. Um, uh, if you're going to turn somebody out down because of what was disclosed in that um, background check, you have to let them know that. You have to send them the copy of the report so they can see what has been uncovered, and you have to give them a chance. Um, but you have to give them, first of all, the form that says this is what your rights are under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, and then you have to give them the chance to um, respond to it really, to contact the company that prepared the report, to respond to the report, and to provide the employer with information um, that they, the applicant wants the employer to have in properly evaluating what the information is. Okay, next slide. Okay. You are, we're just gonna go very quickly um, through documents. If you've decided to hide your job search, oh, wait a second. I skipped one in my own little thing. Okay, this is just a handy checklist. I don't think you need to go over it. Um, we just talked about a lot of it, but this is just um, for your own you know, use later on. It's a little checklist on what you have to do if you're gonna do, use a third party to do what we call a consumer report, okay? Now we'll go to the next slide and um, talk about what happens when you've decided on someone. What do you do about the documents? What do you do about your job search documents? Well, I've got three different things, um, sort of timelines here, okay? First of all, the EEOC um, requires employers to keep their job applicant materials for one year, okay? That's it. You've done a job search, um, you keep the applications for a year. You may keep them longer, but um, at a minimum, you should be keeping them for a year. New Jersey requires employers to keep, you know, personnel records for two years. Um, from my perspective, that's not long enough. You should keep them for longer, just for a couple of reasons. First of all, somebody can sue you four years later, five years later um, on a wage issue. And that's why, um, you know, I say at the end, payroll records should be kept for at least six years. But there's also something called a continuing violation, which means that, um, you know, somebody can sue you and say that the discriminatory um, situation existed 10 years ago. Um, or, you know, they were hired, they were let go, they were hired back. Um, you just should be careful with um, destroying the documents. Um, now, how do you go to the next um, slide? How do you destroy them? There are definitely requirements under New Jersey law um, about what you have to do. It's the Identity Theft Protection Act. And basically, you really have to shred them. You have to get rid of them. You have to make sure that the documents can are not in a state that other people can get information about the candidate or the employee. Um, so the next slide um, tells you a little bit more about that Theft Protection Act, I think. Um, okay, it's all employers regardless of sign. And then it tells you what personal information you're looking for, things like driver's license, save, um, social security number, et cetera, things that can be put together to um, invade someone's identity and steal it, frankly. Okay, next slide. Slip criminal history. Um, there's in New Jersey, I hope everybody knows at this point that there's a ban the box um, statute on the books. You cannot ask about a criminal record in the initial application. You can only ask after you've conducted an interview. Um, so you don't ask on the employment application. You don't make any verbal inquiries before the interview. Um, and if you don't interview, you can't ask at all. It's only after the first interview, okay? Next thing is what happens if you do that criminal history um, check and you find that there is some criminal history. You go to the next slide. Um, 
you only can consider it if it is job related and consistent with business necessity. So for example, I use the example of a school. It's a statutory requirement that, um, that people that work in schools don't have certain criminal um, convictions. Uh, so, you know, you, you really it has to be related to what somebody's going to do. So, for example, if it's a position of trust and they have convictions for fraud and theft, that's something that you can, in fact, um, consider. They're going to be your bookkeeper. They're going to be the person who's in charge of writing checks. That's something that's valid. You also, though, have to consider the nature and gravity, the time elapsed, the nature of the job, and you have to give people a chance to explain um, uh, you know, so somebody might have been convicted for shoplifting, you know, 30 years ago when they were 15 years old, that that may have nothing to do with their trustworthiness at, you know, in their 40s, um, if you're considering them for a bookkeeper position. It's really using common sense. Um, and so that's that's the best advice I can give you. Common sense. Does it make sense that this criminal conviction um, raises a genuine concern in your mind? about whether they can do the job, okay? Um, next slide is for drug tasting. Drug testing only post-offer, not pre-offer. Um, when they're working, you can do it if there's reasonable suspicion. You can do it if there's an accident. And if there are safety-sensitive positions, you can do drug tasting on a random basis. Um, lie detector tests are almost never permissible, um, but with the government, they can do it. And pharmaceutical companies, for some reason, they can do it. Okay. Next is um, cannabis. You know, it's now legal in New Jersey. And there is a statute that says you cannot refuse to hire, employ, discharge, or take adverse action against someone because they use cannabis. Okay. Um, what you can do, of course, just like it's always been with alcohol, if somebody is impaired on the job and it affects their job performance, then that is something that you can consider. But that's really a uniform standard, you, you know, whether it's because somebody didn't sleep enough or because they're using cannabis, if there um, affects their job performance, that's a legitimate consideration. OK, there are now in the slides next are on orientation. Um, I'm frankly. Oh. No, co-vaccinations. I wanted to go into this. This is a new one. Um, in May, the federal government um, lifted the national health emergency. Um, so some of the questions we get are, can you still require vaccination? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, and again, you still have to do it neutrally and provide accommodations for um, the ADA, for religious reasons, um, and actually for ADA means for health reasons. That's the disability, Americans with Disability Act. Um, can your employers continue to require employees to be tested for COVID? Um, the standard is a bit higher now that the national health emerge, medical health, health emergency is lifted. Um, you know, it used to be that employers during the height of the pandemic could really test um, at the drop of a hat. Um, now vaccines are more readily available and it's less rampant. It's a, you know, you might have a tough, uh, tougher time doing it. OK, and again, you, you know, if you're using it to exclude people or something like that, that's when it becomes a problem. Um, if you're always uh, testing one person, that could show that you perceive them as, you know, disabled in some way. So, again, you just have to be careful about how frequently you do it and why you do it. Okay, next um, slide is I think we're at orientation now. Um, oh, no, it's where it offers employment. Common sense um, tips. Um, don't say that the employment is for a specific duration because that cuts against an at-will status for the employee. Um, again, it should say it's at-will because that's really important if you want to have the right to fire somebody for any reason. Um, after you usually get the person to sign the offer letter and then you put it in their personnel file. Um, and again, it's going to you know make sure they sign it, make sure they date it. A conditional offer is an offer that says we are um, offering you the job, but it's subject to, for example, a criminal background check or some other background check, um, drug screen, whatever it is. That's a conditional offer. But if you say that and then they fail or something comes up, you've protected yourself. You haven't given them a, a straightforward offer that guaranteeing that the job is theirs. OK, next screen. I think we're at orientation now. Um, we are, and I am not gonna go through these because we're running short on time. There's three slides, um, but this is a good checklist. Once you have somebody on board, you hire them, 
these are the things that um, as a new employer, you should go through with somebody on their first day. And some of the things are um, really important later on. Okay, so for example, you have a handbook. I don't know how many times when um, somebody comes to me and says, uh, you know, we want to terminate this person, they violated a such and such policy, or we want to check somebody's um, email. Um, and I say, well, you know, do you have the no expectation of privacy do you announcement in your handbook? Um, sometimes, and that can become, become important if there's litigation. If they have, if the employee was never asked to sign, to read and sign an acknowledgement, then it's harder to prove that they actually read it and you told them and they they acknowledge that they know that's a condition of their employment. Um, on the flip side, don't hand it to them and have them sign it immediately. Say, this is our handbook. Please look at it. And I, we need your um, acknowledgement within a week because that gives a legitimate amount of time for someone to review it and actually read it. OK, now we're going to move on to terminations. OK, let's start first. Next slide um, with the idea of at will um, employment in New Jersey. Um, you can you know, terminate an employee for any reason, as long as it's not a prohibited reason. Um, sometimes people do have you know, more vested rights. That's if they have a contract, if there's a collective bargaining agreement, et cetera. Um, next slide are the protected classifications. I'm not going to go over this because I just wanted to get a sampling of the um, reasons that cannot be used for discrimination, uh, I mean, for a termination. Okay, next um, slide. What are the exceptions to at-will employment? Well, first is that they're in a protected status. That's part of the list we just showed are part of the protected categories. In New Jersey, there are many protected categories. Um, the protected whistleblower activity. Somebody complained about um, you know, a, a condition at work that is protected. So for example, if somebody says to um, their supervisor, um, I'm working overtime and I'm not getting paid for overtime. And then the next week they're terminated, they may have a um, whistleblower complaint, you know, a retaliation complaint. On the other hand, if an employee says, um, oh, I don't know, um, I don't like the fact that you offer Coke in the kitchen, but not Sprite, I mean, that's obviously not protected, nothing to do with any um, legally protected right. Um, I just, you know, reporting a wage an hour, um, filing a workers' comp claim, engaging in union activities, or trying to organize a union, um, and that can be a very broad category. Um, taking leave under statutes that give protected leave, such as family leave, um, reporting a health and safety violation, any reason that would violate public policy, um, filing a complaint of harassment or discrimination. Um, requesting compensation and benefit information if they're trying to look into um, pay equity, something like that. So these are, you know, some of the reasons you can't fire people. Um, uh, when someone calls me and says that they are going to terminate someone or want to terminate someone, we can go to the next slide. There are some questions that I routinely ask, and these are questions that you should ask before you make a decision to terminate someone, okay? Are they in a protected class? Have they recently taken a leave of absence? Um, have they requested an accommodation due to disability? Have they made any complaints that are protected? Um, if the reason is based on cumulative performance reasons, have you documented? Is there proof that they actually um, had performance um, shortcomings? Um, did the last performance or evaluation um, what did it show? Did they get all fives? And now, you know, two months later, you're saying they're the worst employee you ever had. These are red flags that tell you that you really should stop. Um, you probably should reach out to legal counsel um, and make sure that you're not making a mistake. Um, you know, a protected class, for example, I'll ask how old was the person? Um, you know, uh, are you selecting them for a layoff when everybody else is under 30 or keeping them? Um, and there's no other reason. Those are the type of questions that you want to look at. Um, the errors, next slide talks about errors that people make. Um, and I, I'm not going to go through these, but I just want to um, sort of generally tell you that really it's a matter of managing expectations. You, you know, to have an employee never tell them they're doing a bad job, never tell them you have any problem at all, 
creates a problem down the road when you finally, you know, there's a straw that broke the camel's back and you've decided this is it. I can no longer live with this employee, but you've never told them that. Um, uh, you know, the problem is they're going to think it's unfair. They're going to, um, you know, think it was due to something else. Um, and it may help them prove a case that it's really whatever reason you're giving is what we call a pretext, that it's not the real reason. Because if it's the real reason, why was it never mentioned or documented? Okay. Now, what do you do when you've made the decision? You've decided that um, Mary uh, Smith is going to be terminated. So what do you do? First of all, you decide who's going to notify them. You want to have, we can go to the next slide. You want to have more than one person actually notify them. Okay. Um, create a transition plan. Think in advance. How are you going to implement this? Who's going to take over the duties? Who's going to train them? Um, and how do you make sure that all the necessary information is available? For example, passwords, things that the um, person you're letting go um, has that the next person is going to need. Um, you, in terms of telling other employees, uh, the recommendation is don't tell anybody in advance unless they need to know. It's really not fair to the employee for everyone else to know that they're going to be terminated before they are terminated. Um, you want the people, their manager, you want security, you want IT to know. These are the people that need to know. Um, IT is particularly important in terms of cutting off access um, and blocking remote access um, at the right time. Obviously, you don't want them to do it that morning if you're not going to terminate somebody until four o'clock in the afternoon because it's going to give a tip off that something's going on. Um, the next step in the next slide is get together a, a separation packet, all the forms you're going to want to give that person, you know, HR contact, over a change of address form. So if they, you know, move in two months, and you need to send them the W-2 for their um, wages, you know where to send it. Um, New Jersey requires that you give um, what we call the BC-10 form. It is instructions for claiming unemployment benefits, and it simply gives them the employer ID number. It doesn't require you to say the reason for termination. It just gives them, tells them where they can apply, and this is the employer's ID number. Um, final paycheck, two big issues that often come up. PTO, are you required to pay for unused PTA? PTO, the answer is no, you're not required to under New Jersey law, but if it is your practice, for example, if the handbook says that you will be paid for a crude but unused vacation, you do have to pay it. Um, and in terms of deductions, that's another, it, it's a landmine. People, employers think that they can deduct from the final paycheck um, you know, certain items, like they didn't return their phone to me, so I'm going to take $500 out of their their paycheck. Can't do that. It's very strictly regulated in New Jersey. Um, and, you know, what we recommend is that if you're going to give someone an employee equipment, you have them sign a separate agreement that puts, um, you know, sets out what they have to do, when they have to return it, and what the remedies are if they don't return it. If you advance an employee money or, or advance salary, have them sign something. If you give them a loan so that you, they, it says, you know, um, it's going to be paid this much out of the paycheck, et cetera, and, um, you know, the final paycheck may take care of the balance. Whatever it is, that it's a contract and you have agreement in advance from the employee to take a deduction. Okay, separation agreement and release, we're going to cover that later. Um, but the next slide really talks about notifying the employee, okay? Um, and there's some tips here. Um, you're going to have a termination conference. And what are you going to do? You're going to tell them in person if you can. Two people are there. Um, the reason you have two people there is so that you have, um, you know, witness to what was conveyed and what happened at that conference. Um, it's really important before you go in because it's uncomfortable. Terminating someone is uncomfortable and it can be even more uncomfortable when you actually get there, as I'm sure many of you know. So if you do a little outline, I think that really helps keep you focused. Um, and the reasons it should be stated um, objectively, um, simply and unemotionally. If it's a layoff, you just tell them that. If there's a performance reason, you tell them that. Um, you know, but you don't have to go into details. The thing you don't want to do is tell them, say it's for, you know, X reason when it's really for Y reason, um, because you're uncomfortable. You know, people, employers are people. The same thing with employment evaluations. Uh, you know, managers will give 
five, 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 five exceeds expectations, blah, blah, blah. Cause they don't, they're, you know, they don't like complex. But the truth is that kind of thing can come back and haunt you. And the same is true when you terminate somebody. The reason you give um, may be very important. Other tips on the next slide. Um, you shouldn't disclose information about other employees. You should make it clear that it's management's decision. It's not a particular employee. Okay. Um, don't say anything negative, defamatory. Make sure you tell them what you're offering them in terms of severance um, and discuss the things that are going to have to happen, like collecting property, you know, your keys, your passwords, et cetera. You then want to um, do a termination letter if you can. It should be reviewed, if possible, by counsel to make sure that there's nothing in it that will hurt the employer later on um, and, uh, you know, who signs it. The person who signs it is the one that you're okay getting on a witness stand and talking about um, the termination itself, why it was reached or how it was conveyed, whatever's most important. Okay, after the person is terminated, next slide, what are you going to do? There's a, again, this is almost like a checklist, like what you do when you bring somebody on. Make sure you've done security. Document the termination meeting. You had someone there. Write up a little memo as to what happened. Make sure that you have all the company property back keys, credit cards, phone, confidential documents. Um, make sure the employee has a chance to get the personal property, even if it's that you're going to FedEx it to them the next day. Um, notify people if necessary, their staff, your staff, their com your customers. Um, it's, again, managing expectations. Um, email and voicemail. Um, make sure that there's you put in an automatic response that lets people know that nobody is monitoring this or that there's a new person to contact. Over notification, personnel records. Okay, we're almost to the end. Severance, do's and don'ts. Um, when next slide, when do you give it? When do you don't? Very quickly, it's if you're going to give severance, then consider having an agreement. You're giving money, get a waiver, get a waiver of any claims if you can. Um, it provides a lot of clarity. It provides some protection to the employee, um, but you know it also requires them to waive. Um, what are factors to consider in terms of whether you want to do it? Is for some people it creates suspicion, and they think, "Oh my gosh, there must be a problem here." I'm going right to in a uh, you know in a lawyer, and the lawyer, whoever it is, um, tells them that they have the best claim in the last five years that they've seen and you they they should pay you a million dollars okay um you can't control what a lawyer's going to say um so you know once you offer severance and tell them as you um as i'm going to tell you do in the next slide encourage them to see an attorney you know maybe you may create um a problem for yourself if there really is no claim um be careful with the agreement. Don't overreach. There's some things they can't waive, such as workers comp, wage an hour, things like that cannot be waived in an agreement. Okay. And you can't say that you can't file an EEOC complaint. You can't go to the government because they can, and you don't want it to be misleading. Um, most importantly, in New Jersey, you cannot forbid people from talking about underlying allegations regarding discrimination, harassment, or retaliation. Okay, here are my do's and don'ts. Again, sort of like a checklist. Um, that's it because we're running out of time and I know there are a bunch of questions. So let's see about the questions. Okay. Oh, the New Jersey Warren Act, we didn't do that. Well, New Jersey Warren Act really applies to big, you know, employers where they're going you're gonna have a lot of layoffs, 50 or more. You're now required to offer severance. Okay, um, and if you have questions about that, obviously contact an attorney. Um, I'm looking for the questions because I know there were some and I know we have a few more minutes left. Um, let's see. Mary, good, morning. good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you so much uh, for such insightful information to help us all uh, stay compliant in our hiring and firing processes. Uh, take your drink, it well deserved. You, <laughs> you taught us so much in such a short period of time. Uh, good morning to all of our participants. Um, I'm Randy Stevens from the NJBIA, the Business Relationship Manager, here to help wrap up um, our presentation today and try to get us through some of our Q&A. Um, so I'll just go ahead and say there's a form uh, ahead of time. We do have quite a few here, and with respect to everybody's time, I don't think we'll get to them all, but what possibly we can do, Marianne, if it's okay with you, um, I'm going to pick a few out from the, from the list here, and if we can email sure, these. fine. Open, yeah, we'll email yeah. them over to you, and then we'll, we'll share the responses with everyone once we get you out a copy of today's presentation. Um, so oh, I think that's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. 
Uh, we'll jump right in here. So the first question I see is, uh, if the applicant brings up a protected category on their own, are we now permitted to ask a follow-up question? Um, I think that it depends on what it is, okay? Um, if, if somebody, say, brings up, I'm trying to think, um, the, really, why are they bringing it up? So, for example, if it's a disability and they say, you know, uh, I need X, Y, and Z, or I can't do this, I can't do that. I think you can ask follow-up questions because they brought it up and you're not, um, uh, you know, you're not bringing it up yourself, but I would say use good judgment. You know, may, you don't want them to think they brought it up and you then ignored them because that could be interpreted as um, discriminatory. You just, you know, then later on you reject them and they say, it's because I told you X, Y, and Z. If in fact it's for a disability, you can say, um, like for example, um, I can't lift 50 pounds, okay? Maybe you could ask, is it temporary? Is it something that's permanent? Um, things that, that you might wanna know from a realistic perspective. It might just be that weak, you don't know. On the other hand, um, if somebody tells you that they um, were born in another country or something like that, again, all you need to do is follow up with a permissible question. Are you authorized to work in the United States? Okay, don't just ignore something, but try to ask a permissible question in response. Okay, um, let's see. Any other ones that we're going to look yes, at? Yes, ma'am. We, we've got a couple more here. Um, so uh, here's a question. Is there any risk in hiring contractors uh, that are sole proprietors versus contractors that are incorporated as LLCs? I'm sorry, contractors that are private versus LLCs? So sole proprietor contractors versus contractors that are incorporated as LLCs. Is there any risk in hiring either or? Okay. Um, I, I don't think from a purely um, employment perspective, um, but from a liability perspective, um, uh, you know, it, it might be important. And in that regard, it's, I think the critical thing is, do they have insurance? Okay. Does the contractor have insurance that's going to cover if they pre, you know, somebody gets hurt or they do something? Um, An LLC provides, um, you know, a limitation on liability for the person. So, you know, that's, you want to really make sure that they have insurance. If it's an individual, you don't want to ruin their life because there was a claim and somebody sues for $2 million. So uh, having insurance and um, making sure that the insurance may cover what liability could reasonably be incurred. Okay. Thank you, Mary. And here's, here's the one that's pretty relevant to today. Uh, can you ask for their handles on social media? I would not do that. I wouldn't do that again. Um, you know, you can't ask for passwords, et cetera. Um, I just think it's safer not to. I don't think there's a prohibition on that, but I would stay away from it because, it, you know, it implies that you're going to actually go look. And suppose they have something on their social media that they want you to see. Okay. They're sure. going to give it to you and go right there and ask when you ask. And you might not even look at it. So, so, so here's a follow up to that, then, Marianne. It says, if what if on someone's resume their social media handle is included, are you then able to to go and you know take a sneak peek? Um, I I don't I think that it's the same standards I said before. Um, you know, have somebody the same person do it. Have specific things you're looking for in it. Keep track of what you were looking for when you looked up the ten candidates. Okay. Um, I, I wouldn't do it on an ad hoc basis just because they gave it to you. I'm going to look at them, but not look at anybody else. I'm going to get to this last question. And before we wrap up here and, uh, you know, we'll, like I said, we're going to send these questions over to Mary Ann. We'll, we'll share them with you all once we share our presentation from today. But uh, if an employer has a known illness that wasn't disclosed, uh, that pre prevents them from doing their job on a regular basis and they're out frequently, how do we handle situations such as that? Okay, that's really a um, accommodation question. Okay, um, uh, I don't. I think you're on really dangerous grounds if you use that as a um, say you weren't honest or you didn't disclose it at the beginning. Um, it's just too thorny an area. You would have to treat it as you would anything. Okay, so if they've been there a year and worked a number of hours, you consider it perhaps under the FMLA and intermittent leave. If they haven't been or you're not large enough at the employers for that to apply, then you look at it from a reasonable accommodation 
perspective. You know, um, can you accommodate them um, so that they can perform the essential functions? And sometimes that means, um, you know, letting somebody come in late, letting them take more days off, um, et cetera. But it's a case by case analysis. Understood, Mary, thank you so much. Um, that's all the times we have for questions right now. Again, uh, we will address these questions. We're going to share them with Mary and via email, and then uh, we can possibly get these over to everyone uh, once we share our PowerPoint presentation. Just as a reminder, uh, give us about a week or so to clean up today's presentation, and in your email, you'll get a notification uh, where you'll have today's slides as well as the presentation. Um, we thank all of you for being with us on this morning. Again, I'm Randy Stevens uh, from the NJDIA. On behalf of Alice Jens uh, and Mary Ann today from Conor Foley, we want you guys to have a great rest of your morning, and uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you.